On March 31st, 2023, Dungeons and Dragons Honor Among Thieves hit theaters. It was the fourth live action adaptation of the popular TTRPG game, but the first to not be regarded as one of the worst fantasy series of all time. Seriously, folks complaining about things of power have forgotten the absolute dreck that was the original D&D film. No. <laughs> While everyone who went to see the film in theaters seems to agree it was a very fun, entertaining action film, this was the first of many films to fall victim to 2023's blockbuster slump, and while superhero films were the most obviously impacted, Dungeons and Dragons grossed only $208.2 million against a $150 million budget. That's not so bad. The average movie needs to more than double its budget before it has a hope of breaking even. Okay, never mind! So it's pretty clear that the D&D movie was a flop, despite being absolutely fantastic. In many ways, 2023 was the year of Dungeons and Dragons, for better and for worse. On one hand, this film and Baldur's Gate 3 proved that the franchise had massive appeal. But on the other hand, Wizards of the Coast seemed intent on uh, burning all the goodwill they had with fans. From the OGL scandal to laying off swatches of their employees. With so much bleakness though in the modern past, is Honor Among Thieves a rare high point in the franchise's legacy? Is it a modern cult classic with some serious flaws that we overlooked at the time? Or is it overshadowed by Baldur's Gate 3 so much that it barely stands out? Before we get started, if you like what I do here, take the time to like and subscribe. It really helps the channel grow. Leave a comment to tell us what you think about Dungeons and Dragons cinematic legacy, and uh, if any of you have actually seen the Dragonlance animated films. I can't be the only one who remembers that Dragonlance had an animated film. Or those two direct-to-video sci-fi movies for the D&D sequels, what was it? Book of Vile Darkness was one of them? I don't remember. Anyone else remember those? I'm assuming all of us have seen Honor Among Thieves, so there's not much point recapping the plot of the movie. It's about a father with a past who wants to save his daughter from both Next Companion and the Red Wizards of Thay. At its heart, it's a heist film with fantasy, where the first third is gathering the team, the second third is prepping for the mission at hand, and the last act is the heist itself. It is reminiscent of stuff like The Lies of Loch Lamor or Six of Crows, heist fantasy with some cool characters, cool antics, and some fun bits. The whole while, each character undergoes a character arc to better themselves. Chris Pine's bard, in name only, Edgin, aims to be the kind of man his daughter can look up to, while also still pursuing to find a way to bring his lost wife back to life, who only died because he made a crucial mistake. Olga, Michelle Rodriguez's barbarian, wants to help once they realize Edgin's daughter is being held by Forge, played by Hugh Grant at his smarmiest, Edgin and Holga assemble a crew to rob Forge's treasures and rescue Edgin's daughter. Oh, and also, Edgin and Holga were arrested before the story starts. Look, this is a rough summary. Just watch the movie if you want to know what happens, okay? Oh, Jonathan! I'm not going to recount the whole plot for you. Added to the group later on are Simon, a clumsy wizard descended from Elminster himself. <sighs> Fucking wizards, man. Doric a tiefling druid and member of the Emerald Enclave, and Zenk Dendar, the paladin DM NPC who is just cooler than you are in every single way. Walks in such a straight line. Uh-oh, wait a minute. He's coming up on a rock. Is he going to go around? Nope. Right over the rock. In other words, it's a D&D campaign, through and through. And like any good D&D campaign, the focus is less on the greater narrative and more on the personal journey the characters undergo, with each of them able to have an impact on the plot, undergoing personalized arcs, as well as, on occasion, as a treat, roll a critical failure. Braid, 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 braid. Not all of the characters are perfect, I feel Doric especially gets the least to do, even if she has one of the coolest sequences in the movie, but they're likable enough for you to remain invested in the story. 
Now look, even a year later, there are a lot of things that stand about this movie uh, that separate it from your average fantasy narrative. Uh, for one, the humor. Um, there's a lot of blockbusters out there that incorporate humor that sometimes is derided, that cheapens the uh, the feel of the world. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's humor that exists in spite of the world. And a lot of people will sometimes call this uh, Marvel humor. I like to refer to it as Joss Whedon humor because he's really the or, the uh, progenitor of this type of humor. The humor that hangs a lampshade on the world and goes, hey, that just happened. Isn't that funny? Like brunch. Like, what is brunch? Of course, that is not to say that Honor Among Thieves isn't funny. It, it, it very much is. Uh, but the humor is focused on progressing the plot and characters rather than coming at the expense of the characters. It's not about poking fun at people who are in the plot, but more poking fun at the circumstances. The world is not cheapened as a result of this. It feeds into the reality of the situation, at least their reality of the situation. As a man of honor and integrity, and I can assure you our reasons for wanting the helmet are entirely noble. Yep, I'm gonna rob some. Holger! One great gag comes in when the heroes are descending into the Underdark. A group of intellect devourers pass by. They can sense their prey based on their intelligence, and not one of the heroes are detected. Not even the holier-than-thou DMNPC paladin. Brilliant little gag. I love it. Simple. In one instance, we are given world building, a build up to a tense scene, and then a joke at the character's expense that doesn't break from the world's reality. Rather, it feeds into their reality. All of these jokes work because the characters are so likable. You know, prior D&D films, when they didn't look like LARPing sessions performed by people who had very bad swordsmanship. <laughs> Um, the, the characters were more stock. They were the Barbarian, the Rogue, the Wizard, the Wayan Brothers. But, and, and, and some of the video games did this too, to an extent. Although I will say some games more than others. Obviously, Baldur's Gate is not an example of this, but there were a lot of D&D &D games, and not all of them were nearly as well written as Baldur's Gate. Uh, and some of the novels did this too, I'd say. You know, there's a reason why we talk about Drist and certain members of Dragonlance and not the cast of the Spider Queen Wars or whatever. But the film took the world and concept seriously enough to draft endearing, entertaining characters who sometimes roll nat ones. Step until we reach the three. And that's a bonus that the film brings us. Characters who are likable, interesting, dynamic, and above all else, fun. We could shoot an arrow with a message into her room. What if it hits her? That's a risk we're gonna have to take. On top of that, the creativity in each sequence. Many of the high sequences require the characters to think on the move, which results in some creative uses of skill and abilities, much as would be the case in a real D&D game. Of note is the sequence involving the mirror and the carriage, as well as the final raid on the vault. Also, Jarnathan. And speaking of Jonathan, the effects, not just the CG, which is honestly pretty memorable, but just the practical effects. The Dragonborns in this movie don't move a ton, but they look incredible. All of the monsters look fantastic, despite the budget being substantially lower than your average MCU movie. Hell, it's a lower budgeted movie than Dune, a movie heralded for its incredible, cost-effective special effects. The film also celebrates the legacy of D&D. Yes, it's set in the Forgotten Realms, and while we don't see Drist and his companions stroll about, we arguably see something better. The original cast of the Dungeons & Dragons cartoon, now grown up. That's a real deep cut no one expected to see. Though ironically considering the film takes place roughly around the same time as Baldur's Gate 3 in, in uh, Faerun, it's somewhat surprising though also a relief, that Wizards of the Coast didn't try to force some cross-promotion between Baldur's Gate and, and Honor Among Thieves by having, say, Carlac running through Neverwinter or having Gale show up in uh, Icewind Dale. You licked a dead spider. Dead spider. You licked it. That is something that happened. But don't worry. 
don't worry, I will talk about Baldur's Gate 3 in a bit when it's relevant. But right now, it's not. Not now, anyway. You have far more important matters to attend to. Honor Among Thieves is a solid, solid film. But does it stand out in the deluge of fantasy films and series that have come out in the last few years? Because there's a lot. It's a ton of these. I would say... Yeah, yeah, I would say that. Fantasy is in a weird state lately, um, the last few years especially. There are more fantasy shows than ever before. There are movies coming out left and right and center, both in the West and the East. You got tons of low budget films that get shipped out to streaming services and high budget theatrical releases. Netflix has put out how many fantasy adaptations over the over the last couple of years? Several. I mean, that, I mean. Avatar The Last Airbender and One Piece are two quick examples, but you got Six of Crows that came out recently. You had uh, Warrior Nun, which is an original fantasy series, of course. Um, and, you know, outside of Netflix, you have Disney Plus doing Percy Jackson, Willow having a follow-up. You have Greta, Greta Gerwig for Netflix once we got, is doing a Narnia adaptation right off of Barbie. That's pretty cool. We have a sequel. We have uh, Lord of the Rings follow-up, The Rings of Power. Uh, and a Lord of the Rings anime coming out later this year, too. You got more Game of Thrones. You got an adaptation of The Wheel of Time, one of the most iconic fantasy novels of all time. We even had a Shannara adaptation about 10 years ago that everyone forgot about. That was on MTV. As long as it lives, the demons are locked up for all eternity. And you are now its protectors. I didn't forget that one. I recall that. Shannara is pretty cool. Elf Stones of Shannara? Pretty good book would recommend for a classic fantasy read. On paper, fantasy fans are eating well. On paper. So why are so many people throwing up their hands and saying, this is bad? After all you have endured, it is only natural to feel conflicted. Conflicted? Well, frankly, it's because most of the stuff isn't very good. <laughs> that, that's the jet that's just cut to the chase most of it it's not good i am grateful you have not known evil as i have it, or rather it pales in comparison to the works that they're inspired by or adapting sure house of the dragon is doing quite well but we might as well be saying that because the last couple of seasons of game of thrones was so underwhelming rings of power is a mixed bag at best Getting worse as the show goes on, it doesn't matter how entertaining the dwarves are when everything else feels either bland, aimless, or downright contradictory to the lore that we love. I'd say maybe Willow got the tone and style right. Honestly, Willow feels like a modern D&D campaign. But because of the culture war undercurrents, a lot of people jumped onto the easy talking points of cultural criticism rather than engage with the series directly. It's easy to point at a show with a diverse cast and say, it's it bad because diversity and woke. It's harder to actually engage with the tone and style of the show and break down what works and what doesn't work. And let's be clear, the original Willow wasn't a particularly good movie either. It's far from a masterpiece. It doesn't help that modern fantasy needs to be good or competent to even get to the point where people discuss it at all. A lot of mediocre fantasy from the 80s, a Death Stalker comes to mind, became cult classics due to the VHS market. He was the man they called Deathstalker. But movies like Warcraft, which were disappointing, get overlooked quickly. In the churn of content, being underwhelming is enough to be forgotten. Fox Machina is pretty good though, but then again, fantasy animation seems to consistently be pretty good. All we're going to do is kill everyone and leave. Uh, what about Archie? Yeah, right. Yeah, we kill him too. The current state of fantasy is adapt or continue a story. And every time you do so again, it's diminishing returns. Less of an investment. Less people watching. And that's not great. Or... You become a pawn in the online culture war that has dominated all discourse on any media, uh, especially Star Wars, apparently. So, you know, there you go. So how did Dungeons & Dragons Honor Among Thieves avoid this? Well, 
Otto Among Thieves is no less diverse than Willow. Uh, sure, I mean, sexuality is barely mentioned, though Durek, the uh, Sophia Lillis's uh, druid character, is canonically asexual according to the novelization. But, you know, racially it's pretty diverse. Justin Smith is there, Michelle Rodriguez is there. Uh, these are all diverse actors. <laughs> so, why did the regular cloud of clout chasers not call it woke, not rage about it online? Well, there's a reason for that. Because there was a real controversy going on. Something actually worth discussing that grifters aren't really going to talk about because they want to talk about fake controversies, stories they can control and commodify. This was not one of those things. Dungeons and Dragons in early 2023 was embroiled in a very serious controversy. The kind that doesn't just go away when you stop grifting about it. It's not one you can easily monetize. The OGL Scandal. Around the time the D&D movie came out, the OGL scandal broke. This is one of the biggest moments in the history of role-playing games ever, and I'm not saying that lightly. D&D functions with an original game license that's been in place for years that allows third parties to create content. Entire businesses have been created centered around creating third-party content for D&D. It's a massive reason the community has kicked off the way it has. This doesn't just include extra modules either, but entire tabletop systems like Pathfinder and streaming conglomerates like Critical Role and Dimension 20. The entire modern fan culture exists because of this OGL and can be monetized because of it. And Wizards desperately wanted to monetize D&D more. They decided to modify the OGL, retroactively impacting businesses in the process. Now, it's bad enough when a decision negatively impacts fans and the community, but when you hurt someone's livelihood, that hits hard. The 1.1 OGL update is written to revoke the previous 1.0 OGL that everyone, from Pathfinder to Silverplate, the 5th edition supplement where you play as a hot dog, rely on to produce their content. All of this was Wizards' means to increase capitalization of the D&D property, but the backlash in the community was swift and immediate. Many were rallying behind Paizo, the company behind Pathfinder, and their Orc agreement. Some even claimed that the age of the Orc was upon us. <laughs> that was melodramatic. Granted, Wizards of the Coast eventually pulled back from their changes that they were going to make to the OGL. That was no longer a concern. But the damage was done by that point, and it wasn't done fast enough. Or rather, the pullback wasn't fast enough. People were refusing to see the Dungeons & Dragons movie out of protest of Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro's apparent transparent greed. And many people refused to ever go to the movie, even when the OGL scandal was resolved, because Wizards had betrayed their personal trust. And that's not trust you can just easily get back by showing a really cool trailer making a good movie. You don't mess with people's money. You know that 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 tends to be the uh, the sticking point for many people. So why would a grifter need to make a scandal? The scandal existed, but I find it funny how so few grifters actually did engage in this discussion. Almost as if the grift is a scam and not real. Yes, the movie's success was marred by ill-timed controversy regarding the brand of Dungeons and Dragons, but. Even outside of the core audience, you know, you, you, the core audience doesn't show up. Okay, what about general audiences? Why didn't they come to see Dungeons & Dragons? Well, that's pretty straightforward, isn't it? There were a lot of big hits in 2023. Uh, but most big budget movies floundered at the box office. Hard did, it, hard did okay, though, which I'm happy about. But a lot of superhero films, a lot of big fantasy films did not do too well uh, in 2023. General audiences would see these trailers and go, well, this looks just like the last thing I just saw. And there's a lot of discussion there about, you know, an overabundance of superhero films or fantasy sci-fi films. And that's discourse I'm not really getting into. The problem is Dungeons & Dragons did nothing to really stand out among that crowd. They too much came out around it. <laughs> I just threw a truck at a dragon. I love my life. We'll be ready. 
quite frankly, families wouldn't want to go because the Mario movie just came out, and Mario was a way more recognizable IP than Dungeons and Dragons, especially to kids. So it did nothing to stand out among the crowd. This is why Baldur's Gate 3 ironically stood out, because there was nothing like it in the gaming landscape at the time. It's telling that Baldur's Gate 3's biggest competition in the fantasy RPG scene in 2023 was Hogwarts Legacy, a game that people generally forgot about after the hype and controversy died down. People, however, are still talking about Baldur's Gate 3 to this very day. Praise Mark <laughs> We're nearing a year after it debuted, to say nothing of its days in early access. Baldur's Gate 3 is either a blessing or a curse to this movie, depending on how you look at it. Here's a huge Dungeons & Dragons project that's hugely successful, set in Faerun, features an incredible cast of characters, but because it takes place in a very different medium, exploiting very different tactics, exploiting a very different kind of plot, there seems to be very little crossover appeal between Baldur's Gate 3 and Honor Among Thieves. And, and I mean, it's not too shocking, right? One is an adventure meant to capture the feeling of Dungeons and Dragons, while the other is meant to capture the feeling of playing Dungeons and Dragons. Then that's the key difference. Holmes, your chest constricts. Your thoughts begin to splinter. But it also doesn't hurt that Baldur's Gate 3 features a lot more mature content than Honor Among Thieves. It's made for an older audience. And it has a cast of incredibly well-fleshed-out characters. Characters arguably too complex to fit into a two-hour movie. Like, I mean, some of these characters you need like a ten-hour. The game's a hundred hours if you play it correctly. So that's like a lot of a lot of plot, a lot of slow build. It's it's not something you can easily fit into a a film. If anything, Honor Among Thieves feels like a quick one-shot you and your players are playing, whereas D Baldur's Gate Three feels like the year-long campaign. <sighs> Perhaps he'd find forgiveness in a fiery death. It would take too much time to develop all these characters in, in two hours. But for Honor Among Thieves, the format is perfect for a fun adventure with some easily identifiable characters with, rec with, with straightforward motivations, straightforward arcs that are still very entertaining. Also, Karlak, best girl. Best. By a mile. Not even close. Just the best. I like her. She looks like she could throw me over her shoulder and carry me to safety. Should the need arise. With that being said, how do we follow up on this film? A sequel is being discussed, though it will probably be lower budgeted. A series is in production, but we'll see how that goes. Well, and when I say production, I really mean it, it's... They've talked about it. They've discussed it. Will it come out? Who really knows? A lot is in development at Wizards, but very little is materializing. And that's a worse problem than you might realize. Recently, Larian Studios, the company that made Baldur's Gate 3, has announced they have no interest in making any DLC for Baldur's Gate 3, and they are not making Baldur's Gate 4. They're going to pursue their own personal projects. And it's hard to blame them if you look at what's going on with Wizards of the Coast. The very people at Wizards who greenlit Baldur's Gate 3 have all been let go by Hasbro. In fact, Hasbro has made massive cuts to their staff, uh, primarily in Wizards of the Coast. You're probably wondering, well, why? Corporate greed, mostly. Profits on top have to increase. The CEOs are getting $20 million bonuses, while all the staff that made them the money to get that bonus, they get let go to boost up stock prices. It's all about the bottom dollar for this company. And let's be frank, a company that only values the bottom dollar, are they really going to value a film franchise when the first film did not break even? I'm not optimistic about the future of Dungeons and Dragons on the big screen. The future does not look good. But is a movie successful only if it gets a sequel? How do we measure cinema's success? by how many follow-ups it gets. And let's be clear, in the modern landscape of film, uh, follow-ups are a big component to even having the thing exist anymore. Paramount just removed Rugrats, the, the, re the revival, uh, from, the, from Paramount Plus as a tax write-off, basically, and a bunch of other animated shows. If a show isn't successful now in the age of streaming, 
you may not be able to see it again. That's the reality we live in. Success isn't just, you know, a guarantee of continuing. It's a gar it's the only way you can survive to be seen. Media preservation itself is at risk if a thing is not immediately successful. So what hope does in the well, but Dungeons and Dragons isn't a safer place because it is a theatrically released film. It's not a straight to streaming movie where the only resource to watch it is streaming. There is physical releases for it, and that's good. But ownership is difficult in the in digital age, and success guarantees ownership, or guarantees the ability to have real ownership over something. So how do we measure success? Let's get back to Willow for a second here. The film for years was a standalone. It was, frankly, not a great movie, but people loved it, and people still love it. And that love transcended decades with no updates other than some lousy spin-off novels. Same with The Princess Bride or Pan's Labyrinth. These movies don't need sequels. And don't tell me Pan's Labyrinth is a sequel to Devil's Backbone in the comments. I know the connection. I know what happens. I know they have the, soul, the little kids from Devil's Backbone. You know, I know that. We shouldn't measure this film's success based on whether or not it makes money or spawns a franchise. We have to keep circulating the tapes because media preservation is very important. But... That is not how we measure success. We are audiences, not accountants. Let Paramount's money guys figure out uh, if Dungeons & Dragons is profitable for them. Let them crunch some numbers. We don't have to do that. What matters is what the film means to us. What it means to general audiences. So, the question is, is this film meaningful in any capacity to us as an audience, as Dungeons and Dragons players, as fans of fantasy, as film audiences? And I'd say yes. I think it does. A year later, this film still resonates with me. That's why I'm making this video. Now, this isn't just me just saying, picking a, a film that came out a year ago, making a video about it. No, this is a film I think very strongly about. Honor Among Thieves, uh... If I were to make a list of my favorite films from last year, uh, mind you, favorite, not best, uh, Honor Among Thieves is up there, right upside uh, Poor Things, The Holdovers, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, a um, couple others, I'm sure I'm gonna, I remember after filming this. Not, actually, ironically, not Oppenheimer. I thought Oppenheimer, oh, Godzilla Minus One, another good example of a great film. But look, it's up there, it's in that conversation. At least in terms of live action uh, adaptate films, because you, you do animation, you gotta talk about uh, Spider Verse, Boy and the Heron, Nimona, all those as well. It's impactful, and by it I mean Honor Among Thieves, not because it necessarily is deep or has the has life lessons to it, but because it captures a raw feeling of wonder, a raw feeling of adventure. That's something a lot of modern fantasy fails to get the feeling of wonder you get when you look into a book that's unusual. When you open up a new a new fantasy novel that you picked up from Barnes and Nobles and you sit down with your coffee and your tea and you look at it and go, well, what's going to happen here? What is going to hit me? And it's a shame because a lot of fantasy used to have that kind of wonder. A lot of fantasy back in the old days used to be wondrous. I remember when I was picking up VHSs as a kid um, and they'd have a trailer for a movie called The Neverending Story. And they'd have that magical music that would play. And it was like this instant nostalgia, sweet dream fuel when you hear that song. Is Neverending Story a great movie? I don't know. It's good. I love it. But is it great? I don't know. Would it be great for someone to watch now for the first time in 2024? I don't know. But I do know this. It instilled a feeling of enchantment to me as an as a kid and i feel like this movie captures that same feeling of mystical excitement that we are not seeing too often you know there's this trend i saw on tiktok a while back where they just showcase ai generated art of what if this modern film was an 80s dark fantasy film and it lifts assets clearly taken from Kroll, a never-ending story or labyrinth and while I hate AI-generated art and its artificial nature, I have to ask, why do we want to see these things made? Not the easy art of AI, but the 80s dark fantasy film. Why are we craving this old-school fantasy feeling? 
I'd say Dungeons & Dragons Honor Among Thieves comes the closest to capturing the lived-in feeling of old-school 80s fantasy. Yes, it feels modern and slick, but there's that sort of whimsy that we've been missing from the machine of action blockbusters. Authenticity. It's one of the reasons why The Sandman on Netflix works so well. Creators need to make a lived-in world that goes a long way to making something that lasts. I am really hating how my hair looks in this video. This is all terrible. Uh, though I am in desperate need of a haircut, clearly.